Welcome to For the Long Run, the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. I'm your host, Jonathan Levitt. Through personal and professional connections in the running world, I have the privilege of getting to know some amazing athletes. I've always been fascinated by the psychological aspect of running, and this podcast is aimed at exploring this and much more. I hope you enjoy. This episode is sponsored by Johnji. Johnji is a local to Boston running apparel company dedicated to exploring, connecting, and giving back through running. Inspired by travel, informed by function, and built for adventure, Johnji makes running essentials to equip you wherever you run or roam. The company was founded on the core belief that water is a human right and donates 2% of their sales to supporting clean water organizations around the world. I've known the two co-founders of Johnji for over five years, and it's been a privilege to see them grow and increase the level at which they've been able to give back to the running community and to the world in general. Welcome back. I have Alyssa Olenek joining me on the podcast today. Alyssa, thanks so much for taking some time to chat. Thank you for being so patient with how much time it took me to sit down and do this. So. <laughs> well, thank you for 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 not um, insisting that we start the podcast while I was still driving home from uh, <laughs> from my trail run because I think it's only fate that I was finishing my run at two thirty p.m. today. It's only fate that on our podcast that that happened when you told me that and you were like two thirty when we set the time. I was like, you won't be run- done running by two thirty. That's the rule. That's the law. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, Before we get too far, uh, who is Alyssa? Yeah, so hi. um, I have a feeling your niche and followers may actually not know who I am, which is kind of cool. Space of the internet, I feel like where I'm not known, which is fun for me. Um, So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alyssa Olenek. Um, I'm known as Little List Fitness over on the gram. That's my business, fitness, outdoors enthusiast, trail run science page, (laughs) I guess you can call it. A little bit of everything. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate in exercise physiology. I like, I'm interested in exercise, metabolism, um, all things that are central to those themes. I've been an athlete my whole life. I grew up playing lacrosse, running track, cross country, um, played a little bit in college. Then I got really into strength sports and then I found my way back into the outdoors and then ultra marathoning. And now I do Olympic weightlifting and CrossFit and run ultras and do science and yell on Instagram about fitness. And that's like, the, that's literally my life story in like 30 seconds, but sum it all up. I mean, I'm just very, someone who's, I like to learn about science and exercise and do science and exercise and share science and exercise with other people. And that's pretty much central theme to everything that I do. That is quite the recap. I'm not quite sure how we connected originally, but I know it was through Instagram and your Instagram account is so entertaining uh, to follow and also super informative. So thank you for that. Um, my, I guess my next question is, um, where, where did the, the interest, we'll start on the science side, where did the interest for, for learning more about exercise physiology come from? Yeah. So I think when I was an athlete in high school, I was like, not really into school. I was just like, I don't know. I I was so young and you can't really think past college. All I could think about was being a college athlete. That's all I, Mm. I just wanted to be an athlete. Like I just, I fell into athletics a lot later in life. And so I just love to work out. And so I remember, and I wrote about this in my personal statement um, for graduate school, which I think now people know me for running, but before I was really only known for lifting, which is funny how that's like ping pong. But um, running was like the first thing that I found that made me fall in love with fitness. And I remember being like 13 and literally not knowing exercise physiology, any of that existed, but I just remember wanting to learn as much as I could about it because I wanted to be able to share that joy that I had ex- started to experience with others. Like that was like a very important moment in my young life where I didn't really know exercise physiology or science existed. I just knew that like, I wanted to learn a lot about that. So I could share that and just for my own personal, I mean, when you're an athlete, you like learning about things, right. That, that serve and interest you. Um, and I went through high school and I was just really into lacrosse. All I want to do is play lacrosse in college. Um, and so I actually almost went to school for business, but then I ended up having to switch my college last minute. Uh, the coach got fired. My scholarship was kind of up in the air. My parents were like, you're going to go into a ton of debt. If you do this, like, don't do this. So I ended up switching schools and walking on to a different lacrosse team. And at that point in time, I just, I, I was really kind of only going to business at the time because just it was like an easy solution for things that I kind of thought I wanted to do. I was interested in the exercise science labs, but at the time it was like 
more money. And I, I, it was just like, I was young and I didn't really know. And I thought I was too dumb for science, honestly. So I remember when, um, my parents told me to switch and walk on to the team of the school that I ended up going to for college. I remember a distinct moment of being like 17, 18 years old. And my dad, before all this even happened, he really wanted me to go to like a D3 school, academic focused. Um, he didn't really care if I did business or science or whatever I did. Um, he thought I was a lot smarter than I was. And I remember him pushing these things and like crying in my living room and being like, I'm too dumb to pass a science class. Like I'm not made for this. Like I'm too dumb to do this. And so, which is funny that like, I was like, I'm going to fail out of biology. So I ended up walking onto this team and health sciences were the best, one of the best programs that my college offered is a really small state school PA teaching and health science are really like their, their main bread and butter things. There's a couple other science degrees in there that weren't too bad, but um, my mom was like, well, why don't you do this? Like, and she's like, and you basically had three tracks. It was pre-professional PT or PA. My mom's like, what do you want to do? Like, like that's your life choice right now. She's like, you want to do P- PT or PA track. And I didn't even know what those careers meant. And so I was just like, just do the non-decided one and I'll figure it out as I go. Dece- like I'm switching colleges like the month before where it's like July and I'm doing this. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I got into college and um, I'm in this pre-professional health science track. I don't even know where I got this idea from, but Marie Purvis is a lead Nike personal trainer. And I thought she had the coolest job in the world. And she had a, a degree in exercise science, but it was the, her, like the thing I read from Nike was like exercise physiology. So I like going to college and I'm like, I'm going to be an exercise physiologist. I don't know what an exercise physiologist is. And I tell this to the, like my first year seminar advisor and he's like, and I explained him what I want to do. And I'm explaining that I want to be like a personal trainer is essentially in my eyes what I was explaining. But like, I want to be more than a personal trainer. He's like, you should change your major. You're in the wrong place. And I was like, no. I was like, science is harder. This is the better track. This is a better job. Like, I know it. I don't, I'm just stubborn. That's me. Um, and so then I went to Dr. Dixon, who ended up being my amazing undergrad um, advisor for all four years. And he's like, no, you're in the right place. Stay here. And so I still had those crippling doubts of that I wasn't smart enough to like be in science. Um, but what happened is I ended up because I walked on a new team, I really wasn't as good as like, I wasn't recruited to be there. I was a walk on. I wasn't as good. I kind of sucked compared to everyone. It was like the best, one of the best D2 schools in the country for lacrosse. Um, so they're just very, a large bout of talented girls. And so, um, I was like, not like thriving in sports, but then also I was like, so, so, so afraid that I was going to fail out of my science classes. So I got six tutors the first semester of college. Um, and I just studied like a psycho. Like that's all I, I like, didn't really have friends. I just studied like a psycho. I got six tutors cause I was so afraid that I was going to fail out of school. Like I went to two different biology tutorings. Like I was just crazy, but I was just determined to not have that happen. And what ended up happening is I got about half of the semester and I got an A in the first bio exam and people on the team started to catch when then I got an A in the bio exam. And everyone was like, Oh, Alyssa, can you tutor us? Can you help us? And what happened across that semester is that it went from me having this crippling self doubt of I'm not good at school or any of that to being in like biology for the first time ever and actually enjoying what I'm learning, but doing well at it. And then there's a moment that ended that semester where I was tutoring before finals week, all of my friends who ended up changing their their majors because they hated science on the glycolytic pathways and um, like energy systems, which is funny because that's like my PhD research is now. And we're in the library and I'm, I understand this stuff. I am on a whiteboard, dry erase board, like, drawing this out, teaching other people. And I think that just like that, that kind of transition to moment really just set it off for me. I was like, wait, I, and I was in an anatomy at that time and a couple other classes. And I like got, I think like all A's and an A minus my first semester of college or maybe a B plus and something. I don't know. Like I did very well. And it was just this sudden transition where I was like, oh wow, wait, I, I, I actually can be good at school. I'm good at school. I never had that identity. I was like an honor student in high school, but everyone was like an honor student in my high school. It felt like around me and they were all going to be doctors and lawyers and super successful. And I just never viewed myself as one of them for some reason. And I was like, wait, I'm actually like doing well at school and I'm doing well in science and I can actually maybe like be good at this. So it just kind of like was this big pivotal moment where I was just like, oh. And so I just started to push really hard academically the rest of college. But I think that transition of like seeing myself teaching people and understanding things and communicating that was really big for me. Cause I was like, okay, I really like to learn things. I really like science and I like teaching that and sharing that with others. And that just kind of shaped the way I spent the rest of college. So I went from like self doubting, thinking I wanted to be some Nike personal trainer, not know what I'm doing with my life to like kind of accidentally falling in love with science. So I always say that I found uh, exercise first 
I fell in love with science by accident. So I didn't have some like big life plan to get a PhD. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just kind of like, I knew I'd like to work out a whole bunch and I was an athlete. And then, <laughs> and then I found out along the way that there's an entire field dedicated to the study of that. And I was like, Ooh, okay. Like that's cool. I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the way that you sort of leverage your, your knowledge of exercise physiology and how energy works and all of that is fascinating because you're, you're both a strength and power athlete and an endurance athlete. You just ran a hundred K you run what nine ultras um, and you also train heavy. Uh, so talk to me about the intersection of, of strength and endurance. Cause I find that fascinating. Yeah, so it's nine trail races, seven ultra marathons. I don't want you to think I'm cooler than I am. <laughs> um, I ran a half marathon. You gotta bring me down just a little bit, then. Bring me down. I know it's really crazy. I feel like I can't believe I've ran seven ultra marathons. Like I feel like I just started ultra marathoning, but it's me, and I go really hard, really fast in everything that I do. Um, <laughs> I'm just crazy like that, I guess. Um, <laughs> That's just who I am. Very low energy, right? Oh, God. I just don't know how to explain to people. They're like, how do you do so much? I'm like, have you literally seen me? I have so much energy. Like, I need to run myself. Like, I'm literally a dog. <laughs> um, but no. Um, so, yeah, I grew up. I guess I technically didn't really. I grew up an athlete, but I played lacrosse, and I would run a ton um, to, for cross training for that. Because in my very rudimentary thinking, it was like, the more I ran, the better the athlete I would be. I probably should have been playing catch a lot more than I was running, but I ran a lot. I would stay after school and run. And I started actually, I got really fortunate that I started lifting at a young age. So I wasn't like super strong, but I did like do like very basic lifting in the gym in high school. And then in college, you start training more um, with like lifting for sports. And I, I mean, I got pretty strong and pretty quick, um, but I wasn't anything crazy. Like I still was very, very undertrained is how I would describe it. But then when I quit lacrosse, um, I walked away from the team my sophomore year. I really, I think a lot of people can resonate with that it, with all of us, whether we were athletes before or now, like I needed something. I was an athlete my whole life. That was a big identity for me, but I love to move. I love to challenge my body. I love, it's like, it's like a big self ex science experiment, but I also just, I love it. Like I'm happier working out when I have like an objective and a goal, you know what I mean? Not making it about my body, just like having fun, seeing what I can do. And so I did, I walked into a CrossFit gym about two weeks after I left the lacrosse team in college. And I did that for about a month and I, I, I had to leave because I couldn't afford it at the time. But I think that that really helped cascade me into like, I just touched a barbell in a way that wasn't like they, I mean, the way the the strength training they gave us when I played lacrosse in college was like the most sissified girly crap. Like we weren't even allowed to do deadlifts looking back. I'm like, that is the worst instructions ever I've ever been given in my life. Like I was like horrible women will break if they do deadlifts information, you know? Um, but then I, I went, I like touched a barbell and could do pull-ups and the woman there, luckily it was a female coach and she was like, you're really strong. And like, she really just like kind of lit that fire in me where I was like, Oh wait, like I had no idea that I was like, I'm, I'm definitely more of a, you know, natural strength person, but I, I never thought about that at all. And so I just spent the rest of that summer. Just like, I was like the, I joke, I was like the girl in a gray t-shirt with pit stains in the back of the weight room with the dudes at my local YMCA. Like that just became who I was. Um, and I just started to, I didn't really know what I was doing. And then I didn't, I went to college that year and I was still figuring it out. And so I wasn't weak, but I didn't get like, I didn't have any really good structure with my strength training. And then once I started to get a little bit better at it and figure out what I was doing, I got really strong, really quick. And I started to do, um, a lot of power lifting, lifting style training. And I did a strongman competition in college. Um, and so at this point where I'm starting to get fit, I did like three tough mutters and I was still running quite a bit and lifting, but then I slowly started to like, just get deeper and deeper into just strength training, like pure strength training. Um, so towards the end of college, I did my, the last semester of college, I did a strongman competition. And then I, that next spring I had graduated college early. So I was back home in Pittsburgh. I did a deadlift competition. And then that next fall, I started my master's degree and I did a full powerlifting meet. Um, I got really strong. Like I, at one point deadlifted 400 pounds, like back squatting over like 305 was my max. Um, like I'm a very like super strong, impressive, strong, stupid, strong. Right. And so I power lifted, but then I got really unathletic within it. And I, so I wasn't happy. I wasn't fulfilled. Um, and I started at that time. It was like that next summer, right after I kind of like tapered off powerlifting and I was running a little bit more. Um, but then I, I got, had a back injury. So I like, I remember I just like didn't do anything but walk maybe for like a month. I have no idea what I did looking back. That wasn't the appropriate response, but I didn't know any better. Um, and I remember going out to Colorado for the first time ever and doing like, a, I think we did like a 17 mile hike and I'm like a fit, young, healthy person. I should be able to do this. 
And we did other hikes that were shorter, but I just was demoralized the entire trip. And I was like, I never, ever, ever want to feel that physically incapable ever again. Um, so I ended up going to Zion for a backpacking trip that fall. And I just started rerouting my training into, um, step ups and running and cross training and like, I'm training to hike. Right. Um, and I'm running a little bit more. And then after I did that, I just, I don't know, I, I got a taste for the outdoors. I started, I started taking more trips and hiking and doing these things a little more often. And so I was like, okay, I want a piece of that. And so I, I know I love fitness and I love being strong, but I loved being outdoors. So then I transitioned and that's when I moved into doing my first trail half, taking bigger outdoor trips, do my first 25K. And then at this point, I'm in my PhD phase and I decided I'm going to run an ultra marathon. So I just took this big pivot 180. But um, during that time, I've then ran two ultra marathons. Then last year, I ran three more. Um, but then I took some time off and joined a CrossFit box, got into Olympic weightlifting. And now I've just ran my first 100K and I did another 37 miler last month. But the last two, three years specifically, I've really done this thing where I've started to bring together that heavy strength um, with the ultra endurance training, which is kind of goes against everything we know to be true. So I think it's important to recognize that when we talk about these things, like you have to talk about what your priority is, right? Like I'm never going to be an elite front pack ultra runner, but my goal is to, I'm trying to maximize both. And so to bring this all back in, I feel like, sorry if I've got a little long winded with my, my story, but I think it's important to show that how I like kind of transitioned between them to find that. Um, I kind of just wanted to make fitness what it was for me. And during that time I started, I ran my first ultra marathon during my first semester of my PhD. And so I had my master's degree, but I've learned so much more in my PhD and I've become really well read and well versed in energy systems and like what that development means, um, strength training, muscle physiology, stuff like that. And so I'm like, okay, well, we understand how these things work fundamentally in our bodies, but how do we maximize their potential? So the goal when it comes to hybrid training, the way I do it, it's not to be the best. It's not to like maximize your VO2 or your strength potential. It's essentially to maximize them both to the point where they don't become a detriment to the other, right? Like that's CrossFit theory essentially as well. So it's, it's very parallel to that. And so a lot, I think this past year, this past training cycle is the best I've ever done it at now in my third year, which of course it's going to take trial and error. And I think a lot of people, when we talk about combining lifting and running, the, it, it's really hard to do because you almost have to do more training, right? Usually something has to give. And so it's about maximizing both as much as you can, but it is a trial and error. And it really does take time for your body to be able to handle both at that capacity. So I was not as strong as I am now my first year of ultra running, but I was a little bit faster. And then the next year, um, <clears throat> I maintained some strength, but then I had to give it up later sooner. So this year I finally feel like I figured out a way to make it click. But a lot of what that comes down to is I do a lot of slow aerobic training that isn't fatiguing to my type two muscle fibers. So like a lot of my running, especially because I'm doing ultras, is slow, low aerobic, like especially my weekday runs, I'm not giving that stress to my body, not really, you know, taxing my, my um, more powerful muscle fibers. And then I was lifting four, then three, then two days a week, but I actually sustained four days of lifting until I want to say two months out from my 100k, which is a lot for me. Um, And then eventually, you know, your mileage gets higher. So it's harder. But a lot of my training would be, you know, strength training in the morning, do a run in the night, separating that out by three to six hours. So that interference of those pathways is minimized. Um, or stacking my workouts in a way where they were on different days running and lifting, but I was almost always running on fatigued legs, at least for my hundred K's goals. I wanted that. I wanted to train myself to move when I was tired. So that was almost strategic at that point where in other races I've made it so that I'm recovered a little bit more. And then doing those really long, heavy runs on the weekends and then recovering, like I would make it so I timed my mon- my Sunday back to back run would be done at like about 10 a.m. on a Sunday, so I'd have almost exactly 48 hours to recover until my first lift Tuesday, and I would front load my lift volume for the week, and then I would do a longer run middle of the week. So it's all about optimizing that distance between them, but then also the recovery that I was doing, so that I'm really only taxing one energy system at a time. So like. By, like we say a lot, like keep your hard runs hard and your easy runs easy. Like that also applies with resistance training, but I was doing a lot of that. Like, um, I also did a lot of CrossFit wads up until I want to say July with my training. So a lot of my high, harder intensity work was my CrossFit stuff or my EMOMs for my lifting or, um, anything like that. Then my, at least my like 
midweek filler runs were a lot more low zone aerobic um, cause speed work is a little more fatiguing and I've done a little bit more of that in the past for shorter distance ultras. I just didn't really do it this year cause I felt like it wasn't necessary for that, for my fitness and status and the goal in the race that I was doing. It just didn't fit into that equation for me. Strength was more important. Um, but then I was doing tons of really hilly vertical gain, difficult trails on the weekends that probably made up for some of that. So it really came down to understanding that like, I wanted that ability to have that slow and low, but then maximizing power output as well. So I'm able to do both. And I mean, at one point, I think I ended up losing my lifting a little bit earlier than planned this year due to some personal things that happened. But um, I squatted a 275 max back squat this year. And I, I mean, it's hard to gauge performance in um, my 100K because it was just such a different race. But I ran that 37 milers in sub nine. And that's like a very above medium level performance for a female out there. And so um, it wasn't ultra fast, crazy, but considering that I am also able to move the weight that I do, that was like a very good litmus test for me that like this theory and crazy way of combining fitness isn't totally insane. It's just about maximizing your potential in both in a way that you can also still recover from. Hopefully that made sense. Sorry if that got a little long winded, but that's like my <laughs> approach. Definitely. So 2020 is a year, I think, where a lot of people are experimenting with new training philosophies or new fueling strategies or whatnot. And if you're not, you know, maybe I invite you to, to try something new as a way to um, have a little bit less risk around it because there are no races or there aren't that many races. Um, so it's a good time to, to try something new. So um, Alyssa, I'm curious your take for somebody who might be interested in um, I assume that most people listening to this are definitely, you know, maxed out on the, not maxed out, but, but doing the endurance side of things, yeah. but not probably necessarily. More than that. They're probably though. listening to that yeah. and they're probably like, this girl just straight does low zone running, but to, in my defense, <laughs> in my defense, if you've never ran in North Georgia's mountains, then you just can't <laughs> even talk to me. <laughs> right. So, but, so, yeah. so, so. For somebody looking to get started in yeah. um, in strength training and adding it to complement running, what what do you recommend? So I think the biggest thing is, and we I talk about this with people a lot, and I really try to make this very clear on my page, but it's hard for people to understand. Is you really have to talk about what your main goal is. So if your main goal is to be a better runner, and you only care about your running pace and performance then like what your strength training looks like is going to be very different from me who like my fundamental long-term goals are to be basically, I, I, I don't, there's only so much strength I'm willing to sacrifice at the cost of running. You know what I mean? And I recognize that. And then there's, but then you also have to look at like, okay, this is where it makes me mad when people don't talk, they like dismiss combining running and lifting. Cause then we have the gen pop runners where arguably they're not doing high volume running, but they're also should be strength training for health and like injury prevention and stuff. So like right. it's, you have to really take a good self-assessment first of, okay, what is my top priority? Because that's how much that's going to dictate how much lifting you are doing, if that makes sense and how much that's important. And so, um, I think for, a lot of runners, they're given like, I joke that they're given like the just as, sh as, as shitty information as the Fitzbos give to like women. Um, cause runners are given like only glute banded bridges, activate your glutes before you're fine. Ha ha. Like, and it's like not, it's no more load like than your body weight on a downhill. You know what I mean? Like you're not actually right. loading your tissues. I know I'm going to offend someone somewhere. Someone's going to be like, I know. No, it's good I, it, for people that, for people that don't follow Alyssa, this is like her standard, um, this like how I do things. 6, 6 AM on a Monday um, Instagram <laughs> post. So, so it, this is, this is the real stuff. So it's, it's very yeah, this fun. Is to it's see. Just, <laughs> it just, it, it undersells to people what they actually need to stimulate their body. So like, yeah, your bandage stuff is fine. That's great. I do monster walks and lateral walks and clamshells. That's not bad, but it's just not enough. You know what I mean? Like your glutes aren't sleepy. Your glutes aren't not firing. If you your glutes weren't firing, you wouldn't be able to stand up. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like I mean, obviously, like you can like you need to have mind muscle connection and all that. But your glutes are probably weak. Your hip, hamstrings, core quads, angles, that whole lower body chain is probably just weak because you've never loaded it with more than your, your body weight, right? You're running and running is incredibly oxidative. Um, it's not hypertrophic at very minimally. You might gain a little bit of weight from running, um, or muscle, but maybe only if you're doing like sprints at hill, you know what I mean? Like to some degree, like it's not impossible, but, 
um, you're not ever really loading your tissues. And unless you do a ton of speed work, you're almost never even tapping in and using your type two muscle fibers, right? So a lot of like general joggers aren't even, you know what I mean? They're not even doing that. Um, and so the biggest thing I think that runners are afraid of is that they don't know how, or they feel like they can't load their tissues. And so what I mean when I say load your tissue, it's a very fancy way of me saying, expose your muscles to heavy weight or lift heavy. And heavy is relative to each person. So a lot of people like, we're not saying go in the gym and you need to squat a 275 back squat. Like I worked up to that for years and like I've had training cycles that are specific to that, but you need to be doing something. Even if you never touch a barbell, which I know a lot of runners for some reason are afraid of barbells and I don't think you should be by any means, but a lot of us are even training at home this year or we don't have the resources and that's fine. But I think a lot of runners, they train at home. They literally only have like a monster band. You know what I mean? And that's fine to start with. And even body weight lunges and glute bridges and air squats are fine. But I really encourage people to get, if you can go to a gym or you can get something that's a little bit like more serious of progressive of heavier, um, to actually lift like heavy. And when I mean heavy, I mean like you should be feeling like by your last rep, you could only maybe do one or two more reps left. And you're progressing that weight over time and increasing it over time. Like I said, it doesn't have to be a barbell. Barbells are great, but kettlebells and dumbbells are also amazing for this. And so it's not also going to make you bulky. It won't slow you down. Um, and the only way that would be is if you actually go through and actually intentionally try to get beefy and really, really strong, which is a choice. And I will tell you right now, you don't accidentally, I joke that I accidentally got strong, but I was like intentionally doing things that pursued it. <laughs> like, like I had a genetic potential, but I didn't just like walk up to a barbell and was like, oh, hey, sweet, cool, world record. Um, but you're not going to become this big, blown up, crazy, heavy. I mean, even if you look at, you've seen pictures of me. I mean, I'm muscular, but if you saw me in day-to-day -day life, you would not, you know what I mean? Like you wouldn't think that like I'm She-Hulk. Um, so it takes a lot, like it takes a lot to develop muscle tissue that's to the point that it's going to slow you down. Cause at some point muscle is energy costly. It costs oxygen and energy to demands to move forward. Like it's not, uh, a, by physics standpoints either, it's not optimal, but lifting itself doesn't need to be that. So I, I think a lot of runners tend to also then sway towards that 15 to 20 rep range for some reason on things, but you're like, you're doing endurance all day long. Stop that. Like you're already, you're already doing endurance on your muscles all the time. So doing things that are in that like three to six rep heavier, stronger range or eight to 12 rep range, like those more strength and hypertrophic, which there's a nuisance to that. You can get strength and hypertrophy technically in any range, but those more neuromuscular demanding, like lower reps of that one to six area. And then like six to 12, where you're going to be like actually challenging your muscle tissue and actually being able to load it is where you probably want to hang out. Cause you're doing repetitive, constant turnover motion all the time, but actually like then giving your body the op opposite stimulus and developing the neuromuscular control and demands and muscle muscle development in your body. And I think a lot of runners don't understand how much that carries over to injury prevention, but your overall athleticism and performance. So you don't need to go be trained to be a power lifter to use that style of training and have it carry over and benefit you um, in your training because you're going to be challenging your body in ways that you're not exposing it to with running. Um, but so with that, you know, because working in those lower rep range or moderate rep ranges, loading your muscle, lifting weights that are heavy enough that they're actually challenging you. Um, and I would say like for most people, you know, if you can get a barbell, that's great. Um, but you can do a lot with just kettlebells. Like, and so some of my favorite movements for runners are going to be things like, I think also like you, you should be lifting and training your whole body. Right. So I always tell people like push, pull, hinge, squat, carry. That's a really basic way to think about it and approach it. And if you're a runner, you can, a lot of us are busy. It's hard to fit our mileage in. We're struggling with getting that. And you could, even if you have some heavy kettlebells or weights at home or a gym, you can even do as short of a, even like a 30 minute quick um, lift, even 20 minutes at the least is going to be fine for you. Start light, um, start progressive, ease yourself into it, but you can, should be doing movements that fall into those categories um, and our full body. But I love doing things like squat patterns, but especially things that are unilateral to carry over into our running. So like step ups, lunges, single leg RDLs, things where you're actually challenging your body to stabilize, but also be strong underneath it. I love that a lot, especially as trail runners, because um, I'm a trail runner. So I use a ton of that stuff to help me develop that muscular control that I want, but also strength within that um, and under fatigue. 
But then you also want to be doing your shoulder presses, your chest presses, your rowing patterns, and things like heavy farmer's carries or single arm carries, uh, deadlift variations, all of those things. It's not just only lower body. Having a full athletic, strong build will help you carry over into just being stronger athlete as a whole, how much muscle and how strong you get within that. You can, you can make the choice to, but a lot of doing a lot of that heavier stuff that's lower rep ranges even is so neuromuscular that you're not going to gain a ton of mass, but you're still going to gain a ton of benefits of having that strength and loading your tissues for that. Um, so I usually encourage people to start, if they're doing nothing at all, start easy. Like don't go all the way to failure every single time when you first start out, like ease yourself into it, get exposed to it. You're going to be sore at first and tired. Um, work it in slowly with your running, obviously, because you're going to be fatigued from that and that's going to make you more tired, but build up over time. And I really encourage people from a general health standpoint, but runners too, try to get in two lifting sessions a week. And if you can make them full body, like they don't need to be anything special, but you can get in two general full body lifting sessions a week. And you can just go through that little list that I gave you of like push, pull, hinge, squat, carry, or like instead of carry, you could do a core exercise and get there and do that. And like a, like a heavier supersets or back to back and have it be as short as 20 to 40 minutes and not have it totally be detrimental to your running plan. But then you get all those benefits of that within it. So hopefully that answered that. Yeah, definitely. The piece that I struggled with before adding it in and I, it's definitely fallen to the wayside now that I don't really have access to a gym. But, um, the question I have is where, where for, for somebody who might be running five, five days a week with a long run and a workout, you know, in yeah. the middle of the week, where is best to add that strength training in? So I think that's where like the decision on that really does depend on your goal. So I'm assuming people here, like you have a more running specific goals. And so I would always prioritize your run. So I wouldn't do it before your speed workout. Maybe if you do a speed workout during the week, it actually might be good to do it like after, cause that's also a heavy, like more, uh, type two fiber demanding day of your training. So you could just have your hard training all be within that day and have your easier days where you recover. Um, or I would do it. Uh, so like you could prioritize that for being earlier in the week. You know what I mean? So you kind of have that and you have the muscle power to complete that workout at what you're trying to do, but then spacing it out far enough from your long run that you're not fatigued from it. So I think like somewhere in that Tuesday to Thursday range is probably pretty good. You also have the option too, depending on your, your running schedule. Um, you could always add it in, you know, the days after your long run, if you know what I mean? Like if that's like, seems the best for you, you might be fatigued. It might not be feel great, but it might help you space that from speed work and your long run or the day after, depending on when you do your, your workouts, um, generally trying to space it out three to six hours seems to reduce any interference. Um, I personally, there's a, there's two different types of approaches to when you should do them. I'm on the pro of doing which whatever one is the biggest priority to you first, uh, running will deplete your glycogen stores and decrease in or increase neuromuscular fatigue a little bit more than lifting. Um, so it will impair your lifts, but if running is your main goal, then you know what I mean? You could do that before that where I tell people if lifting is, main, is their main goal to do lifting first. There's also some literature to show that the uh, like the last bout effect where the last stimulus you gave yourself is the one that you're, you're getting the most. Um, I think for the most part, I wouldn't worry too much about that as much as like you're just eating and getting in everything that you're doing. Um, so I would say either doing it like prioritizing your speed work so it doesn't make you fatigued for that. So either the day of or like after it or – uh, maybe the next day with paired with like a slower, lower run, you know what I mean? Um, but then spacing it out around your, like maybe a 24 to 48 hours before your long run. I will say with this though, and this is an important note that I think a lot of people, when they start doing this, they just, they do too much volume too quick, or they're unfamiliar with the fatigue level of what this gives you. So it's probably maybe possibly better to start adding this in. If you're like, if you're peaking for a race, don't add it in right now. You know what I mean? Like it just, like you're going to be so fatigued, you probably don't have the recovery for it. But I am always encourage off seasons of lower running, um, where you add that in to build up the fit, like build up your base of strength fitness. And it's easier to maintain it than it is to develop it during a higher running phase season or protocol or race training phase. So it's a lot easier to maintain it because then once you're used to that stimulus, your body is adapted to it. So the more you're adapted to it and the more you develop, you like divvy out the volume of what you're doing across the week, it's going to be less 
fatiguing, just if that makes sense. So um, instead of doing like all of your legs on one day, and we've all done this back, you know what I mean? If we got into the gym for the first time ever, we do like a thousand million reps of leg day on one day and then we can't walk for a week. But if you had taken that and broken that those out into maybe two or three full body workouts throughout the week and put that in there, you'd be able to recover between them and it would be less fatiguing, but you'd get the same volume. You'd recover better and you'd have more adaptations. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's better to do it all at once just to get it in during the week. You might be better off even doing something as simple as little as like you finish your runs and you do like a 20 minute strength training circuit, but it's like low enough fatigue that you can do it a couple times a week and get that stimulus than totally toasting yourself and not being able to run the rest of the week. That makes sense. Thanks again to John G for sponsoring the podcast. I've enjoyed seeing John G grow over the years and their gear has only gotten better as time has gone on. I have a few pairs of both the AFO split and AFO middle shorts and highly recommend them. Their singlets are super cool too. You can take 15% off all month with the code FTLR15. I hope you love them as much as I do. And now back to our conversation. Um, so a bit of a higher level question um, and switching gears a little bit. Uh, why do you run? Oh man, this is a great or, question. Or sorry, <laughs> let me let me let me build into it. Do you remember your first run? I don't remember exactly my first run, but I do have like romantic visions of when I fell in love with <laughs> running. You know what I mean? So I think I'm definitely more now like the strength chick, I guess. Like I would say by identity, I'm way more known for being strong and crazy and psycho more so than I am like a runner, but people associate me with running now. But, um, it was, I, I, so I have two running flashbacks. Um, so I grew up and I did like cheer and gymnastics and dance, and all that stuff. And so I remember a cheerleading, we would maybe do little things here and there, but I never really had to run, run. Um, but then I joined track my, my seventh grade year, um, because it's just the thing to do, right? I don't know. People just joined track. It's like everyone did it. So I did it. And I remember I did, I went with the sprinters cause I just assumed I would run. I had no idea, but I was not, you know, when you don't have any fitness and you just like for the first time you want to die, like, it's just like, it feels like yeah. you want to die. Um, and I remember I was so miserable and I hated it so much that I joined pole vaulting because the pole vaulters didn't have to train running. Like you, I just did pole vaulting because I didn't have to run. So that's what I did. I was like, sweet. I hate running. I'm not going to run. I'm going with the pole vaulters. And then that next year, uh, in eighth grade, I was so excited because the cross came to my school and it was, I wanted, I wanted to play like a real sport and it was so cool. And so what I found with that is once that season went on, it was like a club for eighth grade. It wasn't, it was like associated with the school, but it wasn't part of the school sports program. So we would go every day, but we would jog from the junior high to lacrosse and then we would play lacrosse when we'd practice and what I started to realize is that I was always faster than all the other girls I was always at the front of the pack and I got more fit and I started to develop that and so I started to recognize that that was a strength so I was like oh okay I can run like I'm I'm fit like I was never a great athlete when it came to hand eye but I was like oh okay I can do this so that summer after eighth grade this is where like I fell into running quote unquote and I write about it in my, my proposals for school. Um, I just remember thinking, okay, I'm going to run all summer because I want to be better. I want to make the varsity team next year. I want to play lacrosse. I want to be good. I want to be better. So I just ran all summer. And I just remember my dad coached my brother's football. My brother's two years younger than me. So he's like in sixth grade. And so my dad's coaching this and God bless my parents for my dad, I guess, for being so independent. I'm literally 13, 14 years old. And I ran I would run from my house about four miles to the football thing, which when you're like 13, 14, that's the biggest, that's that's far, that's far. Right. Um, and so I remember like, I don't even remember, I don't think I remember the first few runs, you know what I mean? Like, I don't remember how I started doing that in my head logically, but I just remember eventually that whole summer and I would always run in like the afternoons or like maybe whatever, but there's just, I call, I said, I fell in love with running in the Meridian back roads. I just remember just, like not one specific moment. It feels like a montage in my head, but I just remember these like rolling green, beautiful Pennsylvania back roads and just listening to music and running and discovering like how cool it was that my body could do that. And I could feel that way. And like, I, it was like that freedom and just how, I don't know, like how powerful our bodies actually are and how capable they are. And I just thought it was the coolest fucking thing in the world. So then I just was like, I've just, I feel like in that moment, I just officially was a convert. I mean, I've always was active my whole life, but 
that was the first time I ever like independently on my own as a human was making the choice myself to engage in non-forced physical activity, not for gym class, not for sports. You know what I mean? Like it was just like, I was choosing to run on my own and I would run and then my dad would drive me home. And it just, that carried out through like the rest of high school. I just always ran the back roads in my hometown. I was always running the summers. I was always running to train for lacrosse. And so I really remember just like it just being the coolest thing. Like I had just discovered the best secret in the whole world and I just loved it. Um, so I really ran like all through the rest of high school all the time. And I never really ran more than maybe six miles at a time other than cross country where we probably did more miles and like maybe up to 10 in practice. But um, that wasn't until later in high school, but I just, it was just something really cool. Um, and I just, I don't know. I, I just, I loved it. So. Awesome. What, so, so where did your desire to run ultras and, and go longer than, um, you know, 5k and whatnot. And, and did you, did you, it sounded like you quickly jumped up to the ultra distance. Yeah, I'm a crazy person. Um, but I have a large <laughs> athletic background. So I had done yeah. I had done three tough mutters that were like half marathon distance. And in training mm-hmm. for those, which now looking back, they weren't really that hard, but I was like scared. I was nervous. It was my first time doing anything like that. I got up to like 10 mile runs during that. So I would, I, I had like, I remember the very first day I ever ran 10 miles in my life. I thought I was like, my mom called me 10 times. The sun was setting. I was running laps around the, the parking lot down the road from my house to get to it. But like, you know that? I was like, I'm going to get 10 miles in. Um, and so I had done that and I ran pretty much all through college until I got really hardcore into powerlifting. So it's not like I didn't have like any base going into it, but, um, or any experience historically, my training age was still there. And so essentially what happened is the summer of 2016, I met my boyfriend now, um, we weren't dating at the time, but he's a trail and ultra runner. And so I had been exposed to trail and ultra running in college and I volunteered at um, Heiner 50K and Eastern States 100. I worked some aid stations. I helped with like gear handout and entry things and stuff for volunteer hours because my professor had worked, had was a runner and did trail running. And then I actually did my undergrad research project. I used trail runners as a population. So I was just exposed to the crazy people. You know what I mean? So like I knew what it was before and I thought it was the coolest, craziest thing in the world. And as an exercise physiologist, like it just fascinated me. I just thought, okay, wow, like this is, I was like, this is so cool that the body can do that. Like I had never conceptualized anything like that. And so I had read like born to run, you know what I mean? And thought it was like, got really like just intrigued by all of that. And so I did a few trail runs and hikes at that point in time. And now looking back, living in central Pennsylvania for college, I really, really missed out on a lot of like <laughs> accessibility to trails. I didn't know I had. Um, and I just always really liked, was interested in outdoors and stuff, but I just didn't know how to pursue it. And so I just had gradually gotten more into outdoors those few years before. And so when my boyfriend moved back to Georgia, we had like kind of been friends, mutual friends. We were in the same program. And he was like, well, there's a three mile trail downtown. You can go, you can run on. And it was a couple miles from even campus. So I started, I got to the point where I would like sometimes drive there, but I could also just, I would just run there. I would just run to this trail. And I remember I just started running trails, like these little three mile loops and they absolutely, because trail for some reason, even if it's flat is just really, really hard, especially when you first start. And so I was getting back into running shape and I was running on these trails and it's hot and humid in Kentucky and I'm getting attacked by horse flies, but like I'm doing like little three, maybe like six miles at a time total and just getting exposed to it. And then I was like, okay, this is cool. Like I wanted to, I don't know. I never really thought about running races. I just started running more and doing trail races. But then once the whole go to Colorado thing. And then I went to Zion. I just knew that I wanted to integrate more outdoors type stuff into my life. And so, um, my, I never ran any road races, honestly, ever. I did cross country and had done a few things, but I'd never had, um, I just, I skipped the whole like trip, like half marathon, marathon culture, road running. I just completely skipped over that. Um, and a girl in my program and I were supposed to do the half mar- a road half marathon in Louisville. And she just decided she wasn't going to do it. And I like had gotten my mind that I was going to run. It was the last semester of my master's like bro gym college culture was, I was just over it. I was sick of lifting in the gym. I mean, I still lifted through that race, but I just got really sick of just only doing that. And I had just kind of got over that powerlifting phase in my life. Um, I wanted to feel athletic again. So I was like, okay, well, so I'll, I'll do this. And so Regis suggested to me at the time that this trail half marathon on Louisville that he had done before. And he was like, well, you could just do this one instead. So I literally within, cause it's me, 
Um, I signed up, went and bought new shoes and drove to Mammoth Cave National Park like the next day and went for a run. Um, and that was at Mammoth Cave is not the best place in the world to run at all. But I just started with like little baby runs and we just wrote me a half training marathon training program. But I remember it was about a month of us, maybe not even like maybe three weeks into dating. And he took me to, um, a mountain out in Smoky Mountain National Park on the way home from a conference. And we power hiked up and ran down, which is like a very traditional trail runner thing to do. Um, and I remember thinking that was the coolest thing in the world. I remember running downhill, down the mountain, and just feeling like, like I don't know. It was just it was just magic. You know that trail magic, trail feet moments that happen? Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, I want more of this. This is so cool. Because it wasn't those little flat, boring three-mile trails. It was like trails and mountains and it was like extreme fitness combined with outdoors which is like something that I love so much and I just trained that rest of that spring for my half marathon and I was running on you know I was running on road and then I would go I would drive every Saturday um to do my to Mammoth Cave National Park to do my like one to two hour runs which at the time seemed like eternity right like eight to ten miles I remember over spring break my first eight mile run and then I hiked three out in Mammoth Cave National Park I honestly think I died and ate like three donuts after because it was like the hardest (laughs) thing in the world um but it was really hard for me like transitioning into trail running was super hard for me and it was really demoralizing a little bit because I wasn't really good at it naturally um and it was just challenging and it was so different and so then I did my trail half um and at that point in time I was like okay well I don't remember when or how or why, but the, I think I think it was that summer. We had went out west. We took a, a trip for like three or f- even more weeks, lived down by Honda Civic, drove to California and back, and did a bunch of trail running and hiking. And the first day we were out there, Regis, my boyfriend, picked this route to do Mount Humphreys and Flagstaff that was the, the back route, quote unquote. And Trail Run Project had it at 20 miles, and it was an, actually a 30-mile day. And so... <laughs> So I technically did like an ultra distance day without doing an ultra before I did an ultra. And I remember coming down off that mountain because ultras intrigued me for years at this point, but I never thought it was physically possible for me. And I just had moved 30 day for 30 miles on my feet that day. And I remember like sitting there, ripping my gaiters off, feeling exhausted as hell and like looking at Regis. And I was like, is that what it's like to run an ultra? He goes, he goes, yeah, you're just in better shape. Like I was, and like, he's so brutally honest. And just, I got it in my head at that point in time where I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And so I did a 25 K that fall and that 25 K ended up being 18 miles. And I was ruthlessly mad and it really defeated me because it hurt. And I was mad and I cried and I had like an injury and I was really, really pissed. But I just kind of decided at that point in time that I was going to run an ultra. Like I just, I just, you know, when you make that choice before you make the choice, you're like, I'm going to do this thing. Yeah. So, so we had moved for our PhD um, to Georgia and there's actually quite a bit of trail running in this in the in the south especially in Georgia and I just decided I don't even I think I decided before we even moved um because I remember training January 1st I or even before January 1st because I ordered like a Sanudo wash and I was like ready to rock I don't even remember signing up for this thing I just remember I was like I'm gonna run an ultra this year I think I didn't sign up until February I think I let myself train for a month to see if I could actually do it um and then I was like, no. And I signed up for a race right outside of Atlanta. I was like, I'm going to run an ultra. And so it was just like that long, like it was like curiosity in college, dabbling in trails and outdoors in my master's. And then it was just like that fuck it full send. Like I like to say a lot of the time, sorry if you have to bleep me out of your podcast, but I just wanted to see if I could do it. I just wanted to challenge my body. I wanted something different. And I had just started my PhD. And so I felt really mentally weak. And I wanted to lean into things that I'm not naturally good at and were really hard for me. And I think training for that first 50k might have been the hardest thing I'd ever done. Because at that point, I mean, I trained for a 25k and a half marathon. And I always, I'm not the world's best runner, but I am, I do train very diligently. I do my miles, you know, I don't really like, you know, some people will just show up to these things. Like, I really do train for these things. And they're hard, they were hard for me. Um, but training for that first 50k might have been the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. But then once I did it, I was like, okay, I want to do that again. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's how ultra marathons, they get you like that. I was like, okay, I want to do that again. Um, cause I feel like I didn't trust that I actually did it. And I didn't do bad. I ran my first 50 K in like seven hours and 17 minutes. Like I didn't like tank it. Um, but I was just excited. I, and, and then I just feel like I got the, the bug on it. But for me, it was like, I wanted to do something that was hard and mentally challenged me and then I sucked at especially with starting my PhD something that was like really hard and scary and I sucked at it just really complimented that for me 
Um, but then my love of outdoors and just movement and challenging myself, it kind of became like the perfect catalyst for all of those things. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to sign up for something, not knowing if you can do it or, or not certain how well you can do it. And I find that type of challenge to be, um, particularly exciting. Like I've, uh, um, I did rim to rim to rim in the grand Canyon almost a year ago. Um, exactly. And when I committed to doing the out and back instead of just the South to North, I was like, I could probably run from the South rim to the North rim today. And like, that would be attainable. I don't think I can do the full 40 plus miles, but I can train for it and, you know, figure it out. And I, I think that that's the, um, like the put yourself out there type goal that, um, as you're talking about, gets us excited, gets us challenged and, and, um, allows us to, to level up. Yeah. And I think a lot of like, I mean, I came from traditional bro fitness industry and there's nothing against it, but I think that people really view fitness and challenging as one thing. And I think people really underestimate like really truly how hard trail and ultra stuff is. It's, it's so hard and it's just so mental, but doing that kind of stuff, it, it just started to excite me because it was like, okay, I don't know if I can do these things, but the process of signing up and training for things teaches you so much about trusting yourself and to do the work and trusting your yeah. body and believing that you can attempt. Like I had no idea if I was going to finish my race or not last week. You know what I mean? But I trained like hell all year. There's a, there's a great article by semi rad Brendan Leonard, um, where he talks about like the, like, uh, the positive of like setting, like something, I don't remember the name of it, but it's all about setting really scary fitness goals. And it's like running 50 miles is like one of them. Um, because it's like, it's scary enough to get you off the couch, right? Like it's big enough and scary enough that you don't know if you can do it, but you know that you, if you train like hell, you're going to give yourself the best chance to not totally die in the process of attempting that goal. And then there's the piece that the, the lessons that we learn in, in sports, particularly endurance sports translate into life. Like you can, you can shoot your shot and try things and fail in a slightly less, um, important environment, uh, talking about running versus like, if you make a mistake at work, you know, there are repercussions, or if you don't take a risk at work, there are repercussions, or if you take a risk and whatever, there are repercussions. But the, the ability to to challenge yourself in this way where the biggest um, the biggest uh, potential hazard is like you bonk um, allows you to make these mistakes and then learn from them and and again apply that into um, regular life it's so true and I think it's like hard for people to understand why I would pursue that especially in my they're like why would you do that alongside your PhD and like I also started a business during this whole time and I don't think people realize like how much ultra running actually has really gotten me through a lot. Cause I think like a great example building off what you said, I think my first 20 miler, I took me the fourth, it was the fourth time that I attempted it, that I got it. You know what I mean? But I had such stubborn perseverance to get that. You know what I mean? Like I was so hell bent on that happening that then when I was making decisions or choices in my business or trying to like push things out with my PhD, like that, that, ability to see yourself show up for yourself repeatedly. And even if you fail and face it, cause it's a lot, I mean, if you, if you don't run 20 miles, you fail at it. Okay. Then you run 16 or you run 18. You know what I mean? Like nothing bad happens. Right. You just run two less miles. It's arbitrary. You know what I mean? Your body probably barely knows the difference of it. Um, but mentally like that and just the difficulty and perseverance, but yeah, exactly that. Like taking the risks and trusting yourself to show up for those, but also like knowing that if you fuck up, it's like, you can, you know, you can correct it has been, I mean, it, it's taught me so much about myself and life in the cheesiest way. I mean, I think you can compare ultra running to life all the time, you know what I mean? In all the really cheesy ways possible, but it's, it's very true. Like I think I'm a, such a mentally stronger and just emotionally less swayed person. Now, what, I, from what I've experienced from training for these races, it's not even the race itself where you learn that you learn it in training. Yeah, exactly. And then and then the race is a way to celebrate all the stuff that you get to learn in training. And I think yeah. the best the best way to race is to use it as a that celebration and and like the training is the test or the the road to the training is or trail to the training is uh to the race is the test. Yeah, no. I honestly 
I love racing and I hate training for it. And it's hard for people to understand why I would continue to do these things. Cause like personally, I prefer, I'm my preferred mode of fitness is like CrossFit and heavy lifting with maybe like 20 miles of running a week. You know what I mean? Like that's probably like what I would ideally like to do, but I, the training is where I've learned every hard lesson. It's so difficult for me, yeah. but I have to really face that. And so the the races are nothing but fun. Even when I puke, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> They're the fun part. You know what I mean? They're when you get to like see all your hard work pay off and go out there and talk to strangers and like eat Oreos and like run downhill. Like that's the fun part. Totally. Um, one of the things you mentioned is that you launched your business recently. Um, talk to me about that and, and, um, and how do you use social media to to grow? Yeah, so I officially, well, I'm officially an LLC as of the summer, but I've been running my business now for about two, I literally launched my business the month before my first ultra, so March of 2018, but I had been doing stuff behind the scenes and I was really scared to launch it and I finally just bit the bullet and did it over that spring break. So it was a really, really slow process of that all happening. Um, so it's been about two and a half years, so it is still recent, it's a baby, um, still technically in the terms of anything else. Um, but I launched it all through social media. So I started my Instagram page called littlest lifts now littlest fitness, um, in my masters. And it was a way for me to document my powerlifting training. And, uh, you actually wanted to use it. Cause I, you know, once I was in my masters, I was getting asked advice all the time about fitness and health. And I wanted to just like find an easy way to put that for people. That wasn't my personal page. And then it turned into a way for me to practice science communication. And so I didn't, it was like, I grew some followers in that time, but it was more like a personal fitness page. It wasn't our like kind of teaching. I, I just didn't, I, I didn't have direction and purpose with it. So it was just, I grew a lot of followers from being strong and powerlifting. And then it kind of just was stable for a few years. But then once I left my first PhD program, restarted in exercise physiology, was training for an ultra. It was just, I had this really big pivotal moment when I left my first, um, I left my first PhD program, I quit it and I restarted it. But during that time, it was like, I literally left the program, moved out of Nashville, recommitted to my new program and started my business in like a two week period. I just like had this just, I just, it was a big pivotal moment for me. And so I spent about six months behind the scenes trying to get the gall to actually do it and setting myself up to do it and like doing little things and moving in the background. And I finally launched in March of 2018. And, um, that year of 2018 was like a really big trial and error year for me with trying to like share and find my niche in voice in social media. And honestly, running actually helped me a lot with that. Cause I remember I was training for my race and thinking that no one's going to trust me as a strength coach if I'm running ultra marathons. And it turns out I'm now the lifting running girl. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. that helped me niche down. Cause I didn't realize how many people actually like wanted to do that. You know what I mean? Like not everyone wants to be a super elite front pack runner or, you know, set these amazing PRs and not everyone wants to be full blown beefcake. Like people were like, Oh wait, there's like a huge population we're missing out. So it helped me figure that that was a thing by sharing my journey there. But in 2018, I started to finally kind of refine my message a little bit, be a little more consistent with my content and clearer. And what I realized is that you can grow a lot of business from social media. And so I, being me, there's a trend here. I go all in. Um, I like launched it in March, did a couple one-on-one programs and then just like full out developed this thing I now call the littlest method, which I've revised a bunch of times now. And since then I've released a handful of eBooks and I use social media to drive all my marketing. It's self-marketed, um, share and share content and get business and clients and all that stuff. But I largely use social media as a platform to, uh, I mean, that's the main place I'm located at, but I use it to communicate science around science and or information, educational content around lifting, running, fitness, health, nutrition. Um, I make funny jokes where I make fun of things, parody type stuff. Um, and then just really share my own personal journey through graduate school and, uh, you know, training for ultras, running ultras in my training, my strength training and everything like that. And I really just use, I mean, I've really learned to master Instagram the last few years. So I've definitely went from 2018 was really slow. And then 2019, I feel like I finally started to catch my stride and my voice and niche myself down a little bit better. Um, and then this year, I feel like that all just really blew up and magnified because, you know, you, you learn who you are. It's your third year of doing it. You figure out your niche, your marketing and what you're good at and like how to refine it. And it really blew up in a way that I'm very grateful for. Um, so now I have like 45,000 people who just follow my life, which is really weird and really crazy. Um, but I, 
you know, it has its downfalls and frustrations, but I love it. It's so cool to come online every day and be like, I'm going to teach people something or get online at 6 a.m. and yell about something to a bunch of strangers online. Yeah. Um, but it's been a really cool way to extend my PhD work and have something that's purposeful beyond just like being getting being a PhD student, which can sometimes be a little demoralizing. Um, but also as a way to just like, share my journey through all these crazy things that I do with a bunch of people and use it as a way to not inspiring them in a way where they feel good in the moment, but they're actually taking action to do those things themselves. So it's been a neat ride. That's awesome. Um, talk to me about the, the myth busting that you, you like to do on there. Oh man. Okay. So <laughs> I, tr- I really played it safe the first two years of my Instagram and it was like January of 2019. And I remember I was just like annoyed. My business was, my page was growing. I had like 5,000 followers at that point in time, which is still plenty. Um, but it was really stagnant and I had clients and I had people and stuff, but I wasn't, you know, making any crazy amounts of money, just happy, good, passive, like side graduate school support. And I was like, okay, I'm done. Cause I was like, I was trying to like fit my voice in with everything else. I was never not myself, but I was just watering down myself to fit what I thought other people wanted. And I was like, no, I'm done. Um, so I just was like, R- rip it off, rip the band aid, let's go. And I was like, the science, science is going to take back fitness Instagram. Like I was like, I'm done. And there is a couple pages that have been doing that for years, but in my little niche and circle, I was like, I have all, and I just started to grow this network of women who are really well educated and smart in science. And we kind of started to band together, but I started to grow this network and my page and my voice and like my following because I just started calling shit out. My brother told me, he's like, you need to be polarizing and you need to, he's like, you're so, he's like, literally, he told me, he's like, Alyssa, you are literally the like sassy for absolutely no good reason. You've been this way your whole entire life. He's like, so I don't know why you're not using it online. So like, it's not like, I'm, it's very authentic. That's who I am. I, you caught me in the middle of your podcast doing it. Um, but I just was like, screw it. And so I just started because I was like, people don't want education. They want entertainment. But so if I can bait them with the entertainment, then maybe I can teach them something worth learning. So that was like my approach. Um, so I would just like every week or every seven to 10 days for the year of 19, I would like time it out. I would make a post where I called something out or I was sassy or I like made a polarizing statement. And I just started to create highly viral, shareable content that poked truth at things that people either didn't know were they were getting scammed by or they were pissed by. And that's literally how I like became to be known is I just was sassy and anything that I thought of that is like, I'm like, well, that's dumb or that's stupid or they shouldn't be doing that or why the hell are you doing that or stop it. So I use my sass to not only call, call out BS in the fitness industry, but I do like to use it every once in a while to like challenge the way my followers think themselves and call them out on their own crap too. Um, so I'm just a sassy, honest, blunt person. Uh, so I just kind of leaned into that part of my personality and it turns out it works really well online. <laughs> <laughs> How many times has someone asked about pooping in the woods? Oh my God. I'm so done. I'm so done. If I actually, I restricted my first person on my story yesterday because someone did it. Someone did it again. They asked me a question in a question box that had nothing to do with it because it's over and I'm done with it. So for context of those listening here, um, if you're not aware from the former podcast, I have a, I have nine and a half years of upper level of education and exercise science. I've done all these ultra marathons. I've done a lot of cool things to talk about. I personally think I've done some cool things to talk about, or I have information that is beneficial. And I went through a series this summer where anytime I would put up a Q and a, I would get like 10 to 30 people in every Q and a asking me like people think like I've literally had people message me and be like you're being dramatic about this I'm like no you have no idea how many people are asking me this I do not know why and so I kept like being an, I kept being annoyed by it but it kept coming up and it kept coming up and I was just like I felt like I was like indirectly answering it in my stories every single Johnson's watched this whole thing because he watched me like I feel like we virtually kind of trained together all summer in a weird way in the DMs because we would just send yeah. other pictures after every long run but you know I would do like a Q&A like every maybe week week and a half I usually do a Q&A sometime and I, it got to the point where I got so mad after a long run I literally made a full swipe post talking about like how to like pack it out if you have to, wet wipes versus toilet paper, digging the hole, peeing on rocks, like all the like leave no trace stuff, how to go to the bathroom outdoors, full ass swipe post. And I thought that that would end it. Unintended. Yeah. Full ass swipe post. Unintended. 
Like I literally made an educational, like 10 page swipe post on going to the bathroom outdoors. Like I'm not even kidding. Like, it was like, it's an like, e-book and you got a thousand emails from it. Oh my God. It, it's, it's so bad. Like I literally truly thought that that would be the nail in the coffin, but it was not. So it continued and it continued and people kept asking and asking. I kept sharing the post and sharing the post. And I got to the point where the last few weeks, Jonathan has watched me finally lose my shit, pun intended. Um, <laughs> I started putting disclaimers saying, guys, like, stop. I have a post. Stop asking me about it. Like I started getting sassy. Eventually I lose my shit on my followers and I get really blatantly sassy. And I was like making jokes and I was like, guys, like you can just Google this or like figure it out. You're an adult or stop. Like, <laughs> I, I, like I don't, I don't know why you don't want to use the bathroom, but like, it's fine. And I got, I'm literally, I'm venting about this cause it drives me crazy. <laughs> But I would reshare the post or I would put a disclaimer and people would still like ask me things like they would just avoid the word poop, but they would be like, what do you do if you get your period? I'm like, what do you do when you get your period anywhere else? Like Google it. Like, 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 like literally you can Google it. Or like, they're like, what do you do if you have to pee and another runner sees you? I'm like, you say hi. I don't know what to tell you. Like pick a better tree. Pick a better tree. But then it got so bad that I, I officially lost it because someone asked me when I did a Q&A right before my race, like last two weeks, like before my hundred K I did not one before my, uh, my 37 mile or two, but someone would ask me how many times I pee in a race and do I account it into my runtime? Like they like gave me, and I was like, are you guys actually this fucking interested in my bathroom habits on trail? Like, I don't understand why this is plugging me. Like I give a minute to my followers. I'm like, guys, stop. This is annoying. But like, because it wasn't poop, they still asked it. I'm like, stop asking about going to the bathroom outdoors. Like, please. And so I like, one, I put a yes, no box in my story. I was like, are you guys actually this interested in this? And it's like, most people are like, no, I don't understand why people can't let this go. It's not that hard. And there's just still that 20% that are like, yeah, I'm really interested. I'm like, Google is a beautiful thing, my friends. Like, seriously? And it's not like, I don't understand. I know, I know you get new followers and they don't know any better, but I honestly think I've talked about pooping outdoors every single week since June at this point. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Amazing. Like, um, I think, so, and it, so I, anyway, at this point, I've officially blocked someone from my story because I've, they've officially crossed my boundary and we don't talk about it anymore. This is, I'm very passionate about this. I'm so sorry that I just turned this whole podcast into me ranting about this, but like, oh my God, I, forever's listening to this, Google just can tell you everything you need to know. Totally. You're going to get like 50 DMs from people listening to this, to, uh, ah. asking about, asking about poop. Sorry. Um, my, the only other topic I want to uh, chat about is, um, you recently launched a podcast. So everybody's got a podcast these days, apparently. Oh, um, so where, where did that come from and, and where can we find it? Or, or uh, what is it? What is it about? Yeah. So it's the messy middle podcast. And that came from, I joke on Instagram. I say I live in the messy middle because I feel like everyone lives in such polarizing camps for everything. Um, so when it comes to like fitness and nutrition information, I feel like I sit in the messy middle, but then also when it comes to training, you know, I'm not one all one way or the other. I sit in that messy middle where I combine things in a way that people think is illogical. Um, but a lot of views on how I live my life in just those conversations that I feel like we lose in the intersection because we think we always need to sway to one side or the other. I think we need to have, um, and actually like educating and breaking things down and like all that stuff. So, um, it's called the messy metal podcast and we launched it this year. Like everyone else launched a podcast in the pandemic, but it's just an extra extension of my brand. I do it with my friend here, Kate Carmichael of coach Carmichael, um, on Instagram. She's a PhD student with me. She studies more sports psychology and sleep type stuff. Um, and it's a good balance between my really intense personality and her more docile personality. So it's like that messy middle intersection of those two things. And we talk about fitness uh, she does triathlons and like she's training for her first Ironman. So we have the endurance side, strength training, and then uh, we have other exercise science professionals on there, but also business and things. So it's kind of an, an additional intersection of all of my, my, myself um, in a longer form way. So awesome. Um, and where can we find you if we, uh, for those that don't follow you yet on, uh, on social media? For those of you who don't follow me yet, I'm so sorry. Um, for, when, <laughs> for when you do, just don't ask me about poop. My God, please stop. Make it stop. Um, just at Littlest Fitness um, on Instagram, and then pretty much anything you ever need from me is going to be linked there. 
Awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking some time to chat and I hope we can uh, run together at some point in, uh, in, in the foreseeable future. 2021. I'm taking a year off training for races purely so I can just screw around when we can travel again. So that's my goal. <laughs> Colorado is calling our names. Oh, yes. Awesome. It was good <laughs> talking to you. Likewise. That's it for today's episode. Like many long runs, it's sad when it has to end. I hope you join in next week on For the Long Run. And in the meantime, happy trails. If you've enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too.